The Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club and All Black Crew has been a key part of New Orleans Mardi Gras for more than 100 years. Our next guests dig deep into that rich history with their new documentary, A King Like Me. Producer Fisher Stevens and director Matthew O. Henderson, welcome to the South by Southwest studio. How we doing, fellas? Doing good, Juju. Thanks yeah. for having us. No, I think we're good. also, uh, we could say uh, we're, we're so, uh, like we could breathe yes. now because we've been, we've been oh working on this for a long time and nobody's seen it yeah. till tonight. Yeah. Except for our, you know, certain family and friends, but it's like, we're psyched to be here. Yeah. This is great. Well, I saw it last night and I really enjoyed the film. It was very challenging, you know, and I feel like that was your goal to like do that because there's a lot of like subject matter here that takes this group and kind of like brings you into the world of New Orleans that not many people would know if you're not from there. Yeah. So for Matthew, like for those who don't know, can you like explain what is the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club to people who may not know like that culture? Of course, yeah. So uh, the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure, Pleasure Club is one of the most amazing and the largest Mardi Gras crews in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, it started in 1909 as a benevolent association uh, because essentially during that time, uh, black people weren't allowed to bury their dead uh, mm -hmm. in like public graveyards and cemeteries. So the club would, uh, the members would band together whether it was money or um, or uh, come together as an organization to help the families of the people who were dying. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's a, at its core, that's what it is. It's an orga a community-centered organization that was uh, created to uh, help a community in need. Yeah, I mean, that's like how a lot of like African-American communities like happen, right? It's like right. always born from something like tragic, but like we create the best of what we got. And, yeah. you know, the Zulu Club, like they're just, they're just masters at it and they're really great for their community. Yeah. So uh, Fisher, I wanna know like, how did you get involved with this, uh, with this project? Like, and what is your connection to New Orleans as a, I had, as a result? Uh, in, right before COVID, <clears throat> I had directed a movie uh, called Palmer with Justin Timberlake mm -hmm. in New Orleans. And um, I have a lot of friends there. And one of my friends, Matthew, <clears throat> Matt Dillon, not the actor Matt Dillon, <laughs> another Matt Dillon, <laughs> took me to the, <clears throat> to the club. <clears throat> back then, and then um, I loved the club. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, you know, you feel it in the movie. It's right, like a special right. place. Then uh, COVID happened, we were on lockdown. Um, I was on a show called Succession that we were all on hiatus. Mm. And um, I read an article in the New York Times uh, about why are so many African-American men dying of COVID? And uh, I sent it to Matt and I, and I said, Matt, if uh, we can get permission to shoot the club, we should go down there. And, uh, and Matt said, yeah. And so Matt and I drove in the height of COVID down there and um, we kind of decided, I said, Matt, you're going to direct it if you want. And he said, let's do it. And we just started this three and a half year journey yeah. at the height of COVID. And COVID is a very small part of our film, mm -hmm. um, but it was the uh, catalyst for right. the film. And we got permission. Um, no one has had permission to film in the club like we had. And, and Matt uh, put yeah. the camera on his shoulder and it's been a great journey. For yeah, it. see, I, that's great, because I had a whole nother question, but I think that leads me to another question that we have here. This club is like really exclusive. They're super tight knit, right? Like, what was it like gaining the trust of this group and like them le letting you into it? And yeah, I mean, I mean par it? part of it, it's a great question. Part of it was during that trip, uh, first trip that Fisher and I took down there, uh, we were there for about two and a half days and conduct conducted 16 interviews mm. uh, with members of the Zulu organization, as well as like the surrounding community that are uh, connected to the organization. Right. And I, I think it was just such a raw time. You know, obviously it was, you know, the summer, first summer of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's also a couple months after George Floyd was murdered. Right. You know, so right. there was just such a visceral, um, uh, uh, palpable atmosphere of tension, but also of a desire to share, you know, their story mm -hmm. uh, at that time. So really it was just a, a combination of like the uh, trust that Fisher and I were able to build over time, but mm -hmm. also because of the relationships that Fisher had built in New Orleans, mm -hmm. you know, they knew this wasn't somebody just coming in, you know, to, uh, to be opportunistic and to take advantage of pain. Right. Uh, but, you know, we really uh, 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 endeavored over the course of the three years that we were filming to really uh, become a part of the community and sometimes what that meant is me just going around hanging in the Zulu club without a camera on my shoulder right just talking to members talking to families going to barbecues going to crawfish boils just chilling yeah you know uh, becoming a part of that community um, and then you just build tr trust and and what's essential to our style of filmmaking is right. small small teams intimacy, so oftentimes yeah. it was just myself mm -hmm. a producer and a sound person yeah you know so it, it produced some of the intimacy that I believe comes off on screen I like that and like the intimacy also kind of like 
what you were talking about, it kind of brings out that tension and like it makes people want to talk about that tension and everything. And as I said, like when we started this interview, like this film is very challenging. It was challenging for me to watch. And one of my favorite moments was uh, seeing a, a man, a younger gentleman, talking to someone who's part of the Zulu Club and kind of challenging him, like, why do you have to do the blackface? Why do you have to do this? And you provide explanations for that. So can you talk about a little bit of like the, the Zulu Club poking fun at the historically white uh, other crews like Rex and things of that sort? Like, let's dive into that. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, that, that's one of the things, you know, what Zulu is born out of, you know, when it started back in 1909, like I said, it started as a benevolent association, but it all, also was uh, started as a small parading organization and you know, as we say in the film you know over the course of time they started to nudge further and further in and push the boundaries of traditional white Mardi Gras uh, uh, so that they can you know be seen um, you know, because there's, there's something about, you know, uh, Mardi Gras tradition. And as I'm not from New Orleans. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, but I, what I've read and uh, understand, uh, understood throughout the course of the filmmaking process is, you know, the day of Mardi Gras is an opportunity for social inversion. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. an opportunity where someone who uh, on the surface has a, uh, a lower status or class of life can be uh, a king, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I think uh, there, there's such a beautiful uh, opportunity for Zulu, you know, during the Mardi Gras season and during the, the, the process to, um, uh, to, to push the boundaries and so to challenge the white uh, 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 the white organizations uh, that were Marty, that were uh, parading at the time. Nice. Uh, I have a question for you. What yeah. what was the most challenging part of the film for you? Well, immediately, you know, you look at you know anyone dressing in blackface, you start to go, you you, you jump back a little bit, especially when you don't have the context, right? Now, I'm not from New Orleans. I grew up in Compton, California, and never been to New Orleans. Always wanted to go and experience Mardi Gras, but then you see something like that happening, and you immediately want to know why. Like, mm -hmm. what's the reasoning behind that? And so. I had to like open my mind up and obviously just be open to the uh, concept of there's reasons and a historical context for why this is happening. Mm. And as someone who's like a millennial and like, you know, we're living in a time where everything is being pushed back on, like old regimes are being torn down, old ways of thinking are being torn down and challenged. So being in like in the middle of all that, that's what the challenging thing mm. was, was like, okay, we know blackface historically yep. is, is yeah. an awful thing, but then there's, a way, here's a way of doing it that actually celebrates and pokes fun at like, again, the like uh, crews like Rex and things mm. of that sort. So that's where the challenge for me kind of yeah, came in. No. But I would love for you guys to explain just kind of like, you know, obviously, you know, speaking of blackface, can you dive further into the historical context for why uh, Zulu like did it, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I mean, what they did is originally, you know, there's, Mardi Gras has a masking tradition. You have to mask if you're going to parade on Mardi Gras Day. Yeah. And because of the uh, the turbulent times that they were in from a racial perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, black organizations were not allowed to physically put on a mask because right. there was a fear that they would break into uh, white parading organizations' balls and potentially, you know, rape white women, mm -hmm. you know? So they were restricted from being able to do that. But in a desire to want to participate in the Mardi Gras festivities, they decided to paint their faces. So it was a form of a mask. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of some of the founding members of the organization went to uh, a play at a theater called the Pythian. Uh, and at that play, they saw a vaudevillian troupe that was actually led by uh, black uh, vaudeville vaudevillian actors. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and part of the vaudevillian um, uh, uh, tradition is that all the actors in it have to wear blackface. So there was a play that they saw called There Never w Was and Never Will Be a King Like Me. And so they saw these black actors portraying the, the Zulu tribe in Africa, and they saw the strength that that tribe had, and they were so um, enamored and empowered by that uh, tradition and by what they saw that they decided to use that masking tradition. And you got to think about it, this is 1909. Yeah. We're just a few decades uh, uh, removed from the end of slavery. Mm -hmm. So these are individuals who potentially were, especially in the in the early years of Zulu, former slaves. Yeah, yeah. You know, so to go to this play and to see uh, black men portrayed uh, in a role of strength, beating back the British army at the time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it empowered them and emboldened them to uh, take on the yeah. the look of the Zulu tribe. Yeah. And so then they brought that um, that aesthetic, the black face, the white eye of the vaudevillian troop, as well as the uh, garments of the Zulu tribe, the Zulu warriors yeah. and they then changed their names because when the organization originally started it was they were called the tramps yes. but yeah. then they changed their names to the zulu because there was a pride and a power that they saw and felt yeah. so so i love like the um, 
historical like place mark in that right like 1909 that's yeah. like you just a couple years removed from slavery so they're kind of taking back the power that was taken away from them mm -hmm. but also decades removed from the civil rights movement so it's almost like a lead into yeah. the power that they eventually like will want to gain basically. and during the civil rights movement there was definitely uh, a question mark whether yeah. or not this organization should not only continue that tradition but yeah. continue the whole because then you know life changed connotations changed yeah. And um, I, I think another part of the, the story is the survival of this club, mm -hmm. that it's been, that it's That's gone through all of these, these times. And, you know, it almost, after Katrina, the, the club almost shut down. And then, and then we started at COVID where the club almost shuts down. Mm -hmm. And, um, and now, would you say it's like almost stronger than ever? Yeah. Even yeah. after, uh, even after COVID, it's like. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when we started this project, there were about 800 regular members, uh, not including associate members, like uh, gentlemen that are waiting in the wings to get into the organization. And now there's over a thousand members, yeah. you know, with even more associate members, you know, standing in the wings. Because a big part about Zulu is not just the work that they do or the joy that they bring to the community of New Orleans on Mardi Gras Day. It's, uh, you know, they still, um, uh, 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 what am I trying to say? They still, uh, there's a, 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 yeah, they, they, so pretty much like they still try to uh, uphold their benevolent tradition uh, throughout the year. So 364 days outside of the year, they're doing work in the community, whether it's scholarships for kids, whether it's mentorship programs, whether it's a, a huge Toys for Tots drive that they do uh, during Christmas to, you know, give toys and gifts, you know, to thousands of kids, you know. So for them, it's, they still try to stay connected to the uh, original uh, origins of the organization as a benevolent association. Resiliency is crazy. Yeah, it's, crazy. It is yeah. crazy. Man. And there's going to be about 50 members coming to, tonight yeah. To, yeah. to the yeah. show. Oh, wow. It's going to be pretty wild. Can't yeah. wait to see that, man. Yeah. And uh, speaking of uh, like that resiliency, like now, like I said, we're moving into the future now because we've done a lot of talking like the past and the historical context. When it comes to like the practice of blackface by Zulu, do you see that still happening like even in the next like three years or is there going to be like an adjustment happening? Yeah, you know, it's I, part I, of our movie, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I can only answer that as someone who is not a member of the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club. So all I'm mm. offering is my uh, opinion based right. on observations over the last right. few years. Um, I don't think it's a tradition that they're going to uh, 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 let go. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, one of the arguments uh, of the members of the club is that, you know, why and it, it kind of like goes into the idea of the complexity of traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and for them, I think they would much rather hold on to the uh, desires of the original founding members right. to push right. back against um, uh, the uh, ills that were perpetrated against uh, mm. uh, black men in New Orleans and not allow uh, white uh, culture to dictate what they do. Right. Right. You know, so they're using that, they're owning that. You know, they understand the historical tradition, but they've totally separated what they do. And, and the club, they don't actually uh, refer to it as blackface. They re mm -hmm. re re refer to it as uh, black makeup. Right. You know, because they're okay. totally masking. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They're, they're masking. totally I like, uh, I like separating mm -hmm. the historical context of blackface with the uh, practice of uh, face paint for Mardi Gras. Okay, great. Uh, in turn, like a little tiny sidestep outside of uh, the film, uh, just like the concept of like blackface in general. Like, do you think that the debate on blackface is like a generational debate? Mm. Like, I, I've always wondered because you know what I found very interesting is like this is so ingrained into New Orleans culture. And like I said, if you're not in it, then you don't know it. And yeah. so therefore, like you're having a completely different debate than yeah. the people inside of it. Mm -hmm. But as far as like the debate on blackface, like in general, like you just think that's like a generational thing? Is it like a war between millennials, Gen Z, yeah, it's, boomers? It's, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, from a lot of the conversations that we had, some of which are not included in the film, you know, I've spoken with individuals that are in their 80s and 90s, and I've spoken with individuals that are, you know, millennials. Mm. Um, and it's interesting, like I had this one conversation uh, two days before Mardi Gras uh, back in 2022 with an individual who's born and raised in New Orleans, uh, but she had relocated to uh, Oakland mm. in California and you know when I was telling her about the film and uh, this was just a casual conversation I was having telling her about the film right. and kind of uh, even though we we and the and the concept and idea of blackface she was like no it's interesting she was like you know I'm born and raised in New Orleans grew up going to Mardi Gras every single year and I've never even heard of Zulu's masking tra tradition referred to as blackface right you know right. Uh, so I, I think because and, and it's tough because you don't want to alienate individuals by saying if you are not of this culture if you're not from this culture you can't understand this tradition because right, right. I think there is uh, a room for understanding uh, uh, the tradition of Mardi Gras and Carnival um, 
but I, I, I think there is a disconnect uh, where individuals, especially peering in, knowing the historical context of blackface, can get uh, lost in understand, really being able to understand um, uh, the traditions, the masking tradition. But I've also spoken with, with individuals, and one of them is in the film, you know, Mr. Rainey, you know, a gentleman who passed away a few months after we interviewed him, uh, who was uh, 89 yeah. when he died, I yeah. believe. Um, and, you know, he, and, you know, he speaks so eloquently and beautifully at the end of the film uh, where he's really like, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. Right. He's like, but I hope we hold on to it because that's us. If we let that go, we're letting a, let, we're letting go a part of ourselves. You but know? He, he acknowledges that it is an issue. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That, yeah. It, and you know, he he accused that was one of our first <laughs> interviews. He accused us of just making this movie because we were going to try to end blackface and Zulu, mm. and then we gained his trust because he was kind of the granddaddy, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and <laughs> unfortunately he died right, you know, mm. three months after our interview. But um, yeah, it's it. It's interesting, the younger kids in the club don't have a problem with it, right. mm -hmm. but the young there's a bunch of younger kids not in the club that won't join the club mm -hmm. because of it. So I think there's a, right. or don't want to join necessarily. Mm -hmm. But everybody loves the club, yeah. and, and they love, it doesn't stop people from wanting to go in. I mean, you have to be invited by a member, but to just even hang out, because the yeah. club is an amazing place, and they are doing great things for the community. Yeah. They're important. Yeah, that's, see, that's that. I love hearing this because again, like it's all about like perception and like you know like historical context and you know where we are as a society right now when it comes to that particular issue. I and that's very unfortunate about um, about about um, what, what was his name, Mr. Uh, Rainey. Mr. Mm -hmm. Rainey, you know, like the way because I cause I was very moved by what he said. Yeah. And uh, I believe that's what this film is about, like having like people watch this with an open mind and learning about it, and yeah. this is a vehicle for that. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like the future of Zulu and their like traditions, like where do you two see? Uh, them like addressing issues within the city of New Orleans, like crime and education and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an extremely powerful organization. You know, in the organization, you know, they they have a saying. You know, we have we have uh, individuals from all walks of life. We have mm -hmm. individuals from jail to Yale. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> and 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 it's truly the case. You know, like there's so much power in the club where you know you can be sitting in the club and there's a, a gentleman who is in a former advisor of President Biden. Mm -hmm. There's judges, lawyers, mm -hmm. doctors, um, trash collectors, there's civil a man servants. Who that in the you know, yeah. so, we're all Zulu. Right. Yeah. Right. You know. Right, you know? So, so, so the beautiful thing about the organization is that even if they're not publicizing the work that they're doing in the community to um, help uh, deter crime, mm -hmm. uh, to bolster education, to, um, uh, to make their communities better from right. within, uh, they're doing that work every day. Just with the conversations that happen within the club and the uh, access to those uh, individuals who have power, city councilmen, state mm -hmm. senators, assemblymen, you know, so since they have that access, they're able to affect change in their community from a grassroots level yeah. and beautiful thing uh, from my perspective about the organization is they don't always publicize that because it, it's it's not about getting the credit for it it's just about doing the work mm -hmm. you know so I don't see them stop uh, see them stopping doing that work that they've been doing um, at all great excellent well thank you I think that's a good place to end it on thank well, you so much for, uh, for having us we're psyched to be uh, premiering it yeah, tonight. yeah it's oh, gonna be exciting gonna be a second line is gonna be a band yep. Merlin Riley's playing at our party who's my hey. favorite jazz drummer <laughs> on the planet yeah, it's yeah. Be yeah. Good. Well, we up then. That's yeah. nice. so I, I was excited when I saw the movie, so I'm excited for everyone else to check it out too. Thank you so much for Thank stopping you. by the Incredible. South by Southwest studio. Look for A King Like Me later this year, and you can watch all of our studio interviews on the South by Southwest YouTube page. That's youtube.com slash SXSW. I'm your host, Juju Green. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah, thank you cool. so much for talking. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, Thank you. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure, Excellent brother. work.